All right, hello everyone. Welcome to the Inspired Riding interview series. I'm so excited today. We've got another wonderful guest from the other side of the world for me. We've got Penny Richards with Alternate Touch Equine Supplement Specialists. And uh, Penny, thank you for being here. Do you wanna tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure, um, thank you so much for having me. Um, I am such a huge fan of um, of everything to do with best inspired riding. It's been such a huge positive influence to my riding um, experience in my life with my horses. Um, and really that's kind of what I'm all about as well, really, is, is bringing that change to people. So um, Alternate Touch evolved from my own experiences with, with my horse having catastrophic injury, and then actually looking and going, okay, I'm not having any solutions, you know, nothing is working all these things people say do this do that do the other nothing's actually working so i used my um over 10 years worth of experience working in um in animal science research to actually like look at the the science behind natural therapies so you know i'm a scientist by training but i'm also a scientist who really thinks outside the box and the vast majority of scientists actually are because most of what we do is we're looking for new hypotheses to test, you know, new ideas to test. Um, but those ideas need to be backed in some some sort of foundation. And that's not as black and white as people think might think when they think of science. And there is a huge amount of um, literature out there that supports the ways that various natural therapies can work. And that's where the whole ethos essentially of our of our brand came from was looking at solutions from very much that holistic approach sort of mind body and soul approach and and really looking at it and saying okay so what what therapies what what approaches can we bring together and i'm not um as i said i'm not an your average scientist in terms of you know i use lots of flower essences i use lots of essential oils um i use lots of alternative approaches as well combined with um many of our natural therapies that are really well founded in good scientific research. So yeah, so a little bit different, but basically, you know, I think the reason why we've always connected is because, you know, we're really all about helping to bring all that together so that the horses and us are having more synergy, more happiness, more love, more joy. And and really there's there's nothing more important than that. So yeah, so it's a real blessing to be able to do that and, and influence so many people. Absolutely. And yes, it is a joy and to mm. see animals and their humans feeling happier and healthier overall. It's awesome. Well, thank Absolutely. you for sharing that. Um, let me just check real quick, make sure we are on. Yep, looks good. Okay, cool. I just want to double check. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm going to start with my icebreaker question. If you're sure. hand, if you're handed ten million dollars right now, what would be the first thing you would do? Wow, that's such a good question. Um, you know what I would actually do is anyone who who has. Um, anyone who has any experience with any sort of small business, you know, it, it, it might, yeah, it could be anything from, you know, candle making to, um, you know, to, to anything, um, is that the first thing that I would do would be, I would basically pour it into the commercialization of this business to get our products out to more horses. Um, because there is so, you know, like I'm, I'm a scientist and I'm a, and I'm a creator, you know, I am not a businesswoman, <laughs> and um, and there are so many facets of business, you know, that that can can be so limiting, and and whether we like it or not, you know, money can be such a limiting factor. And what a lot of people don't understand um, about scientific research, you know, and having worked in that industry for, like I said, for over a decade, is it's really really hard to get good scientific research done. It is inordinately expensive, especially with horses, because they are such large animals. And in order to do research that actually, you know, yields um, results that you can trust and believe in, there's a huge amount that goes into that. You need large numbers of horses. You have to take into account variation. You know, so if we're thinking about things like ulcers, 
you know, we've got, okay, what are the different pathologies? What are the different causes? What are the different types? So if you're trying to do a research study, it's not as simple as, you know, take six horses with ulcers and treat half of them with this and half of them with that and see what happens. Um, and that's what a lot of people, not that they don't understand, but people can sometimes be like, well, yeah, they, they would like to know that it's backed by science, but that's such a broad question. So what I would love to do is to be able to do, get the research done behind, you know, all of our products, especially the digestion products, because these these products can be a pharmacological, can potentially be a, an alternative to those pharmacological treatments. So if you imagine the, the benefit to the welfare of, um, excuse my headphones, of, of um, you know, racehorses across the entire globe, um, that would just be like the biggest impact that, you know, I, I could have on, on the horse world would be providing, you know, basically having the research done that allows you to make certain claims, allows them to be um, uh, licensed by the, you know, the, the various bodies that need to license things for, for horse racing and, and really make a significant welfare change to those horses because the industry isn't going to go away. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, this is not a pro or negative, you know, racing thing, but it, it, it is an industry that is not going to go away, but there is so much more we could do to support those horses, both during their racing time and, and post racing. So yeah, if I had that $10 million, that's, that's what I do with it. it would go into more commercialization, more research, licensing, basically being able to get the, the products out to a wider audience where they could make a really significant effect on the, the, the global horse community. I love that. That's absolutely beautiful. Ooh. Let's do it. Let's, I'll, I'll take $10 million right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we'll make it happen. We will. Yeah. Yep. University listening. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so when did you first begin riding and what was that experience like for you? It's um it's a really it's a really, really interesting one. So so I was born in the UK. Um, my parents uh, had nothing to do with horses, so completely in, in suburbia, um, in, in North Wales, for anyone who knows anything about the UK. And I was obsessed with horses for, um, I, I can't remember never being, I can't remember not being obsessed with horses. <laughs> there was a little Shetland pony kept down at the bottom of our road that belonged to a really old lady. And I would go down there and I'd take my carrots and I'd I'd learnt, you know, early on to, to chop the carrots lengthways, you know, so that she, she didn't choke. And I'd take them down and I'd feed them to the Shetland pony. I've got pictures of me on, on the donkeys down at the seaside. I would line up at every school fate, um, you know, to, to wait and go on the pony rides. And I, I, for as long as I can remember, I had this just, like, I just needed to be with them. I didn't need to be riding them. I just needed to be with them. And that was like, came to, you know, brushing, mucking out, cleaning, um, you know, tack. I would sit there, I had, you know, I would use my pocket money to buy a horse magazine, practice my quick release knots using, you know, using string from the kitchen. Oh. <laughs> and um, <laughs> my parents were really resistant to, um, to me riding. And I think a lot of it was partly the safety aspect and also we you know we were we were um, a family of, of three children you know so money stretched and, and they were very big on equity so you know they didn't want you know if I was going to be allowed to go riding then you know what were the other two kids going to be doing and what's all the cost going to be and so on anyway when I was about seven my um either my mum or my dad said to me that um I could I could ride I was allowed to go and have riding lessons if I paid for them myself Oh, wow. So, like, radio. <laughs> and so off I went, and I had to come up with, I think, about six pounds. And, um, and I just did everything possible. You know, I just went down to the neighbours, and I'd wash the car, and I'd go and clean the, clean the kitchen cupboards and save every, every penny of my pocket money. Um, and, and, yeah, I got my six pounds. And then, yeah, true to my parents' word, I think they were pretty surprised. <laughs> my dad, um, yeah, they, they took me to a riding school, and 
you know, on reflection, it was a pretty rubbishy riding school. But um, and I, I was there for I don't know how long, at least a year or two, and I only ever learned to just kind of trot around on a on a pony. But I got to spend pretty much the whole day there, um, brushing, cleaning out the stalls, you know, cleaning the tack, as so many of us do. You know, we just we just become their slave labour. But I had my my two little little half an hour sits on the pony, and I rode this beautiful little buckskin pony who was called Puzzles, and um, I just uh, I just loved every second of it. So I have these photos of me, and you know, we'd found some second hand jobs at the charity shop, and my one of my mum's um, friends knitted me this uh, yellow jumper with a with a horse on the front that had you know the like a, a woolen mane and yeah and never really looked back and, and I was always a nervous rider from from very very early on I was always actually very nervous around the horses but I just loved it it was it was like a moth to a flame so really it, it it's it's interesting now for me watching my boys and, and it was very special on the weekend we had both of them um on Michael was actually riding my one of my horses, gosh, which was amazing. I, I wasn't wow. sure that we had a little talk, had a little talk with Gosh beforehand and asked him if that was going to be OK. And he was kind of like, mm, yeah, OK, <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather it were you, but, you know, I get it. So, um, And yeah, it, it was just having them both on on the ponies um, and just those big smiles and, and just they're such animal lovers, you know. So being able to share that love with them and, and uh, you know, I'd never force it on them if they don't want to ride, that's totally fine. Sure. But being able to share that love and actually being there with them and, and you know, talking talking about how important it is to, with what we're doing around the ponies and how we how we interact with them is um, is a real is just such a such a gift and such a blessing. So. Yeah, so that's my my history. <laughs> I love that. And I love that you can share that with your boys. That's just absolutely mm -hmm. gorgeous. And it is a blessing. And that, that they live with you too. So it's so neat mm -hmm. that they can just go out there and see them anytime. So so yeah, and they often do, you know, come come home from school and the first thing they do is is go out and wanna go and give the horses a pat, which is which is just lovely. That's the sweetest thing. <laughs> Like, because they're family and that's just how it works. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So let's see. What struggles have you had with riding or horse ownership and how have they transformed your life? Such a good question. It's like so many things in life where, where things happen. And at, at that moment in time, you know, they can, they can seem like such a, such a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but then, you know, you can look back a few years later and think, actually, you know, there was this, you know, that ripple effect. And there's a couple that come to mind. One is that I uh, when I came here from the UK, I'd I'd recently started riding again after seven or eight years of, you know, school and college and university. I got back into riding um, when I visited a friend in Ireland and I rode on her horse and it was just it was like, yeah, it was just all came flooding back all that 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 contentment that it brought to my heart and I was like this is I have to I have to have the horses in my life this is non-negotiable it's it's not a it's not a um yeah it, it's it's a need it's not a want it's it's something that's really really critical to my to my well-being so when I moved to Australia the first thing I did was try to find some horses to ride and uh, you know having ridden you know sort of since I was seven and then like I said had this break and then I had a few years of riding before I came here um, I thought I could ride um actually definitely couldn't oh. <laughs> didn't really have the faintest idea what I was doing because having ridden riding school horses you know especially in the UK they're very much just kind of get on point and press and you don't yeah you, know, you have to do quite a lot to to upset them right um and yeah, so over here I found these. I found this lady. I basically put an ad in the what's called what used to be called the Quokka, um, which is just like a kind of little pay, newspaper thing for adverts, you know, before all the all the wanted things that we have on Facebook and stuff nowadays. And I found this lady. Um, she didn't actually ride. She had 
she was a, just a little bit of a horse collector. They had a property. Her, her family were into um, real estate, so they they didn't live at this property. They were just kind of doing it up. It was a pretty rundown old horse property, and um, one of the horses she was she was pretty rideable. She was she was pretty um, quiet, um, a standard bred and a broody mare. So I rode around on her, and I got my confidence up riding her. And then she had this really young horse um, who was Welsh. He was a Welsh cross with something um, very pretty little thing. He was called Oki. Now, mm -hmm. I knew that that someone else had had an accident with Oki. Mm -hmm. um, a friend of hers had, had got on him before he was broken and he had bolted with her and she ended up coming off against a, a fence and breaking um, all her fingers. Ouch. Oh. But I was kind of like, oh, well, you know, I'm not going to be doing anything silly. He's he'd been broken in by then. I'd, I'd ridden him in the round yard and he seemed fine. Like he was green, but fine. Mm -hmm. But I didn't I genuinely really didn't didn't ha I didn't have the understanding that I did not know what I was doing, especially with a young horse. I just was like, well, I can get on and ride this horse so I can get on and ride this horse. You don't and know what you so don't what, know. <laughs> you don't know what you don't know. So one day I decided, um, and I was up at this property on my own. Nobody even knew I was there. Um, so I, I went and I, I thought, oh, you know what, I'm just going to, we've been ridden in the round yard. Let's go and have a ride around this sort of broken down old arena. You're just like a sand area. So I thought I'll just take him down there. All I decided in my head I was going to do was to just walk around, literally, you know. Um, and the last thing I remember is putting my foot in the stirrup. Mm. Okay. And I woke up, it was about two o'clock when I put my foot in the stirrup uh, and it was going, starting to go dark when I woke up. Oh my gosh. And I, I have very hazy memories. I basically somehow woke up, put the horses away, unsaddled, and then I got in my car and I started driving and it should have taken me about 30 minutes to drive home. Um, and it took me about four hours. And um, I... I have very scattered memories of basically just driving backwards and forwards to the front gate because I didn't think I'd locked it. And then sitting there with a with a road map, um, looking at this road map and kind of being like, oh, you know, like where where am I? And then one memory that was very scary was obviously over here in Australia we have kangaroos and um can you know I, I saw a kangaroo and I swerved to miss it which is one of the worst things that you can do because you're much more likely to swerve and hit a tree and obviously I was completely not um not really yeah I was obviously had very serious concussion yeah. and when I got home I um I basically uh, I, I rang a friend I had no idea what day it was no idea what I'd done that weekend and I went into work the following day and, and I was just kept repeating myself, just kept yeah. saying the same thing. And my friend was like, OK, what the hell? Have you actually been to hospital? And I was like, no, 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 not being to hospital. Anyway, so long story short, it was obviously it was a very serious accident. I was very lucky um, to survive, but uh, and, and not kill myself in the car. But I learned from that experience that I yeah I, I really don't know how to ride mm. so I shouldn't be going out riding you know other people's horses and that was how then um, I ended up crossing paths with my friend Alan who is the person who owned Midnight that you know anyone who follows my story will know that he is my heart horse and the foundation behind my interest my, my business and and Alan is a is an amazing horseman and he taught me so much so much um not just in terms of the riding and obviously later playing polo cross, but in terms of horsemanship and, and he has a very natural, but um, a really interesting kind of combination of that, that it, natural, but also that there's a true respect there. The horses look at him with a very different eye, but he's very kind. Yeah. So that really was what led me on a, on a path towards learning more about natural, natural horsemanship and more natural approaches and less of this kind of just treating the horse like a, you know, like a, like a car. Right. Um, and so I don't know whether, you know, I don't know whether our paths would have crossed if it wasn't for that accident. So, yeah, so <laughs> it's, um, it can be strange how these things, you know, and it, and it did teach me to, to be more 
sensible when it comes to <laughs> certainly when it comes to young horses. Well, let me just say I'm very yeah. grateful that you're still here. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> that was a beautiful thing for coming from a really horrific thing. And I'm glad that mm. you found found your, your mentor. That's awesome. Um, yeah. Sorry, it had to hurt that much. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Oh, gosh. It could have been a lot worse, though. So <laughs> we're very grateful. And speaking from someone who's also had a bad concussion at 11, the helmet saved my life. And I had to Absolutely. stay in the hospital overnight. And there was this debate how long is she? having to wait for riding like six months or three months and we settled on four months and that was like the longest four months of my 11 year old life <laughs> so, yes yes um, yeah. But yeah that concussion is no joke and i i can see still the repercussions of it as i got older and had you know my own yeah. social anxiety issues and, and a lot of mm -hmm. other little random things that i soon discovered i uh, recently discovered so i just yeah i commend you that you are on a beautiful path and doing so many amazing things now um because yeah. that's, that's a huge thing um let me go into some of the questions from my group members and then if we have sure. time we'll come back because i want to make sure we get to those uh carrie wanted to know what your thoughts are on alternatives to butte that aren't devil's claw based that's a really good question you know i mean having having such a um ultra sensitive horse mm -hmm. with midnight i've always been very very conscious of of using butte and i still believe that you know it has a place right. when it's needed you know when you have that basically that kind of triage effect and that's also the way that i i also use devil's claw so i i still have it i have it in my what i would call my my first aid kit um, but very much in that triage sense and, and also used with protection. So it's super important to protect that, that gut, you know, if we, if we are having to use anything like, um, like butte or like devil's claw, but it's also important to have perspective because, you know, obviously if you've got a horse who, who has a, has a serious injury, um, and we do need to provide them with that pain relief, then, then we obviously have that ethical responsibility to make sure that we do that. Sure. But we have to be strategic in how we manage it. And in terms of alternatives, you know, turmeric is my go-to. Mm -hmm. And I often see, um, it's quite funny, you know, you'll, you'll see people make jokes and make comments about, you know, how turmeric is this magic, you know, cure-all, heal-all. And, um, and they, they actually rub me up the wrong way a little bit because turmeric is, in so many ways, a really magical product. Mm -hmm. But it does have to be used um, carefully and and um, and appropriately. So, in terms of when we're using it, there's a couple of things that we need to look at. The first thing is what um, quality turmeric it is. So, mm -hmm. to be effective, it needs to be somewhere between three to five percent curcumin, which is the active ingredient. Anything more than that is uh, anything more than that in terms of the percentage of curcumin is actually can't be processed by by the body, and that's the same. For, um, for people as it is for horses. So when you go into the chemist and they have these 95% curcumin tablets, they can actually be doing you more harm than good because they can put a lot of pressure on your liver. That's great so, to know, yeah. Yeah, and also like anything, the, the um, you know, turmeric is more than the sum of its parts. Mm -hmm. So yes, curcumin is the active ingredient, but there are other things in, in the rest of the turmeric that are also contributing. So it's the same as with cabbage, you know, which is one of our products that, you know, we're using a lot of our products. L-glutamine is the sort of the amino acid that people think, oh, that's the key thing. But no, 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 no. There's other things in the cabbage that also contribute. So when we're thinking about our natural therapies, it's important to look at them, like I said, as a, as a whole rather than the sum of individual parts. So the first thing is to be looking for that three to five percent. Now, don't buy it from the supermarket, even buying it from, you know, your, your Indian supermarkets and places, they may not be able to tell you what percentage of curcumin it is in it. Mm -hmm. A good indicator is the darker it is, the darker the colour, the higher the curcumin. Okay. So if you see a really dark coloured one, it's, it's probably going to be quite good. The second thing is that we have to use it in conjunction with um, freshly ground black pepper. So... 
it has to be freshly ground because the active ingredient that's actually working with the turmeric to increase um, that potency, which is what the pepper is for, is, um, is only active for about 30 minutes unless it's stabilized with oil. So that's where I'm a little bit um, skeptical of pre-made products. And even again, coming back to human capsules, um, if you have turmeric, it's like, where's the pepper? How is the pepper stabilized? You know, because you, you actually need it. it. It increases the potency of the, the turmeric um, incredibly. And I know, and I have had this experience myself, actually, I'll, before I get to that, I'll just say, the last thing that we need is the oil. So the oil needs to be an anti-inflammatory oil. So a lot of oils that we feed um, in our horse diets, you know, rice bran oil, canola oil, oil they're, they're both the, the omega-6 oils, which are inflammatory. Now, obviously, if, if we're looking to reduce pain, um, we're often looking to re reduce inflammation. So we don't want to bring more inflammation in with more of these omega-6 oils. And the diet of the horse is usually biased in that direction anyway. So omega-3 oils are very, very, very important. Again, for, for that pain relief, both independently, but also in conjunction with something like turmeric. And the, um, the, the sort of personal experience I had with turmeric, the first one was, um, was looking at the changes in midnight. So when I put him onto this combination of the turmeric with the oil and the pepper, um, he hadn't been countering after his injury. So he had this catastrophic injury about one and a half years into his, re, into his rehabilitation. And I hadn't seen him cantering in the paddock for that whole time. And he's a thoroughbred, so, you know, he, he's normally running around like a freaking mm -hmm. fool. <laughs> right. And, um, and within a week of being on that combination with the turmeric and the oil and the pepper, um, he cantered over for his breakfast. Oh, beautiful. For now, the first time. Which type of oil did you end up using? So there's three different types of oil we can use. Personally, my go-to is freshly crushed linseeds. Okay. So linseed is very high in omega-3s once we crush it um those uh, omega-3s are very volatile so they will just poof into the ethos okay. um so don't buy it pre-crushed from the um from the stock feeders or or whatever um because it's basically useless from the omega-3 perspective um and it's also cheaper to buy it whole you know it's it's, a, it's actually a very over here it's a very affordable product Oh. Having that, um, having just a little coffee grinder, you know, or a little Nutribullet or something like that in your, in your, in your feed room and you just do, you know, half a cup, you can chuck a few peppercorns in there or you can have a little pepper grinder there and you just mix, feed, horse. Um, nice. You can pre-prepare it, you know, like um, it has to be vacuum sealed, has to be frozen. That's why when we use it in our bars, it's basically the last thing that's added and then they're snap frozen and vacuum sealed to keep keep those goodies all nice and fresh. Nice. Um, and and what you know what actually kind of really resonated with with me for the turmeric was I've been using it then in midnight um, it, as part of his his rehabilitation, and it was like the first key ingredient in the first one of our bars that we we developed. But I had a bulging disc and impinged nerve that was causing me huge amounts of pain. I mean, I was taking Panadol osteo, you know, every day just to get around, you know, it was causing me like a sciatica down my leg. And um, we'd done all sorts of, like, you know, I'd had MRIs and whatever else. And they were basically saying I had to go and have injections, you know? Yeah. And I was really, I don't know, I don't really like, I just don't really like going and having medical stuff done um but I, and then just one day I was making up the the turmeric for the horses and I thought hey I, I should try this for myself but I couldn't bring myself to like the, the smell of it like bleh. people make it into you know lattes and you know smoothies and I'm just like yeah no, no I just can't do that <laughs> so what I did was I got little um little Panadol um wrappers and I just tore all the tore all the foil off and I put the turmeric paste, so that's that. In that case, that was the um, 
the oil, which which I think would have been either olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, mm -hmm. or um, coconut oil, okay. are both good oils from the anti-inflammatory perspective, the pepper and the turmeric. So it's all mixed up on the hob, put it in my Panadol wrappers, pop them in the freezer, let them freeze, and then um, and then yeah, basically just take 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 them with food. And as with the horses, you have to build up slowly, you know, and especially if any if you have any gut issues or any sensitive stomach, you know, sort of anything like ulcers, mm -hmm. even for humans, because it can be, you know, like if you think of curries, it can be a little bit abrasive, but you can build up your tolerance. You just do it slowly. So you, you made them patient. with little capsules, you mean, and swallowed them? Is that how you made them? Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. Yeah, so I just put them in like Panadol things and then just pop them out like little frozen capsules and then just took them, took a couple with my breakfast. And the first time I did it, I was driving up the road. So I was driving, um, driving up to the university where I was working at the time. And, um, and yeah, and I got like, you know, I was like half an hour into my journey. I was singing. I was like, <laughs> uh, suddenly was like, oh my God. And then I realized that I was like, hang on. I had no pain. That's awesome. I had no pain. The pain in my the pain in my lower back had completely gone. And um and also the interesting thing is is the re they've done a lot of good quality research with turmeric and with curcumin. And and what they found is that it can be extremely effective as effective as things like Prozac against anxiety and depression. Mm. And you know not that we can, you know, can't go into details here but there is strong evidence of this link between depression and inflammation of the brain so it makes sense that something that reduces inflammation could actually also work up here as well as on um, on pain so going back to the question of alternatives from that pain relief perspective that's where my go-to combination is is turmeric and rosehip which is you know antioxidant and and I use um methyl sulfonyl methane which is MSM so okay. MSM is really great for for your joint pain pains but we also have to be aware as we've said before of, of how things interact so we need the vitamin c for the MSM to be absorbed but I've personally tried taking MSM myself and it makes me very very anxious sends anxiety through the roof it's not a good fit for me whereas I've got a friend who my friend Alan who I play you know polycross with and he for him it's like a magic a magical bullet for all of his all of his physical pains yeah I was so, on it for years and I actually just stopped yeah. this year just to experiment without it and it's interesting you said that about anxiety because I wonder now because I'm a lot more calm lately <laughs> I, I genuinely like so, I found it a little bit like I was there thinking because I'd made up a mix what I make for the horses and also for the dogs because the same combination works really well on dogs too. Oh. So the turmeric with the rosehip and the MSM and and that's mixed with the oil and the pepper. And I had ha made some up and I had some of these those little capsules in the freezer and I hadn't made the connection that they contained MSM as well as just turmeric. Mm -hmm. And after about a week I was like I was like a cat on a hot tin roof. I was just like, oh my gosh. <laughs> and I suddenly was like, hang on. <laughs> there was some MSM in there and and it's just not a good fit for me. So I think it's it's um I am a huge advocate of turmeric. It is if you're going to be using it with your horses, you need, as with anything, you need to be using it responsibly and make sure that you have those combination of the oil the fresh pepper and the turmeric and also build up slowly and monitor okay. your horse because when you get the when you get to the point where it's right you should feel you should see that difference like i see it with my horses they will be more playful you know you'll see them and they're kind of riding around and they they look happy and they're playful but you know i think sometimes we have that tendency to be like yeah you know where where a where a teaspoon will do you know a cupful has got to be better, but that's definitely not always the case. You don't want to so, overdo it, totally. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for all that information. That's fantastic. Um, so yeah. the next one is from Kelly, and she would love thoughts on biotin for hoof health and what's a good amount to feed. So speaking of amounts, you know. Absolutely. 
this is a really, really good question. Um, and I'll tell you why. So when you're making a cake, you know, you got to start with the basics. So, you know, you, you need your, you need your flour and you need your baking powder and you need your eggs, you know, otherwise the cake's just not going to rise properly. So no amount of icing that you put on the top is going to make a difference to your, to your cake. And the same can be said of hoof health. And um, you see it a lot that people want, they want to be able to go into the stock feeders. And, and this is the same for a lot of, um, you know, conditions that we have with our horses is that, you know, we've got a problem. We want to go, we want the solution to our problem because we all, you know, we all want what's best for our horses. But often biotin is, is kind of like that icing. But if you don't have the foundations right, then it's not going to be um, the magic cure-all that, that people kind of can sometimes think that it is. It's not to say that it's a bad product, but you have to start with the basics first. So when it comes to our hoof growth, there's a couple of basics we have to consider. The first thing is our copper and zinc. Now, here in Australia, um, certainly here in western australia we have super high levels of iron like to the to the point where that there is you would never ever need to supplement iron so we have extremely high levels of iron in our soils so it goes into our grass our hay our bore water um and so the amount of copper and zinc that is needed to overcome the impact of that iron is, is much higher than the vast majority of supplements actually provide. So iron blocks the uptake of the copper. Mm -hmm. So you end up with a, you know, often the hooves are not growing very well. They can be crumbly, they can be dry. Um, uh, the coats, you know, they just have, sometimes if they're darker horses, they'll have kind of like this red tinge, mm -hmm. but often they just look really dry and they look flat. Their coats just look flat. So we see it all the time, you know, people going on horse forums, what's going to make my horse's coat more shiny? And again, you know, everybody's got feed this, feed that, feed this oil, blah, blah, blah. But often it can literally come down to something as simple as that copper and zinc ratio and amount not being sufficient to um, outweigh the impacts of, of the iron. In terms of going back to the question, um, that's certainly the, the first places that I would start. So biotin is actually not a product that um, that I even even use for mm -hmm. our horses' hooves because once we get, it's pretty much a case of going. If you can make sure their digestion is is um, working as efficiently as possible, so they're actually absorbing everything, making sure they've got their key amino acids, which are usually limiting, so lysine and methionine. Okay. these are all kind of like the building blocks you know like those core ingredients of the cake so so adding biotin in can be helpful if you've got if you kind of like been down that road of checking checking off the list okay is this correct is this correct are they absorbing this blah 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 and then if all of that is there then try adding some biotin in and see if that actually helps um but often if you cover those bases, you can find that sometimes the problems just resolve within themselves. Nice. That's good to know. And we have a really mm. great supplement that has a lot of the amino acids. Um, I can pass that information on to Kelly uh, as well. Absolutely. So that'll be good. Um, might send it to you first just so you can look at the ingredients. Be <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's actually really important to for, for everybody to remember yeah. that it, it's looking at local advice too. You know, so so even across even across the states here in, in I mean, Western Australia is massive, um, but actually looking at it and and you know because we import lots of our supplements from over east, lots of the big companies, and they will contain they will actually contain even more iron. So they might contain oh gosh copper right. and zinc, and and so you can kind of be like yeah, but they might need that. And for example, I was talking to um, you know another one of of our equine entrepreneur members and you know over in Queensland they have a high, really high requirement for calcium because of the pastures that the horses um, feed whereas over here in Western Australia vast majority of the time our diets don't need much in the way of supplemented calcium you know if we're feeding a bit of loosen right. and various other things we don't have a huge requirement so 
I think it's really important to get to get local um, informed advice and, and don't just feed something just because everybody, you know, kind of everybody's feeding it. I like but the, um, yes. you know, a good amino acid profile and a good mineral profile is, is, is really, really key. Excellent. Cool. Thank you. Um, okay. So one last question about supplements and then I'll have a final one for you because we have to wrap up soon, but um, sure. what's your most popular supplement bar and what results do the horses get from it? That's a really good question. I think the most popular bar that we do in terms of the kind of the real transformational results goes back to our digestion bars. Mm -hmm. So the digestion bars were developed. Um, Midnight had had this lifelong, you know, as part of his rehabilitation program, I started looking into, you know, basically alternatives to help support his his gut because he had a, a lifetime lifetime of issues with um, with stomach ulcers and what I found when I started like um, looking at the scientific literature and looking at the ways that ulcers are, are conventionally managed was that the vast majority of the sort of the pharmacological treatments just simply knock out the the stomach acid so they're generally proton pump inhibitors there's a few other different mechanisms um but the vast majority of the time they're they're looking at working at a singular point so they might be working um to just to just suppress that acid and certainly in in the kind of the veterinary world there is this this ethos of no no acid no ulcer but um but if that was the case then then they would work you know they would work all, all the time mm -hmm. and and they and they don't and the more that I started to look into it, the more that I was like, you know, there has to be like the acid is there for a reason. So horses produce acid 24 seven because they are designed to be grazing 24 seven. That's the way their stomach works. So what are the repercussions if we knock out the acid? What does that mean for the rest of the gut? Because obviously they're still eating. But what's happening to that food, you know, so what issues are we then potentially having within the hind gut what issues are we having what impact is that having on um you know on, on the gut microbiome and and literally like even now in 2022 that the scientists who are working in in this field of, of gastric ulcers they they're just learning all the time like there is new information coming out constantly and especially the ulcers in the glandular part of the stomach they really they they don't even really understand what causes them they've, they've decided they are a separate entity so when someone has says their horse has ulcers it could be in the top part of the stomach that's a completely different um, disease to the ulcers in the bottom part of the stomach and they, they need to be considered differently they also don't respond the same in terms of their proton pump inhibitors and so on it, it's it's basically like having two completely different conditions um but trying to treat them the exactly the same and unfortunately it's it's often the horses that and the owners you know with their frustrations because they're just the horse isn't isn't necessarily getting any any better so i really started to take a few steps back and look at it and say okay so what exactly do we need to look at with with looking at digestion and so the digestion bars contain like a like a team of ingredients you know they're, they're basically they're like a like a group of things kind of working together because everything works like that you know you can't just do one thing and expect that to work so what we have in there is we have ingredients that help to um reduce the stomach acid so to buffer it so you're basically um increasing that ph um so reducing the acidity but they also have an active ingredient in there, which is called chitin. Now, chitin is part of this Chinese, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really into, like I said, I'm looking at things from all different perspectives. So a Chinese medicine approach for dealing with stomach ulcers, even in people, is using um, ground up cuttlefish bone. Oh, wow. Because and part of that is that the chitin that's in there, um, the principle is, is that it can form like a protective coating mm -hmm. over any lesions that are present and help and help to facilitate that those changes in that healing 
and it was actually a my acupuncturist who 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 told me this and I was like okay that's really really interesting especially when you look at one of the medications and they use for ulcers which is called sucrophate which has that same principle of protection Mm -hmm. and coating so we basically combine that we have the the cabbage so dehydrated cabbage it's really important that cabbage is dried if we feed it to our horses or it can cause gas colic okay and um that has l-glutamine in there so Mm -hmm. the l-glutamine what they found with people is if you gave people with ulcers um cabbage basically cabbage juice and this was a study done you know many many years ago um, it reduced the time taken for ulcers to heal from an average of 40 days down to an average of seven days. Wow. It's quite remarkable. Like it comes back to this kind of idea of we have, which I got introduced to by an amazing um, guy called Dr. Bruce Ferguson, who's no longer with us, but actually looking at it. And that's where, you know, like I was saying before with pharmaceuticals and taking bits of things is actually like, there's so much in nature that is already set up for us you know we don't need to mess around with it um you know and learning from learning from nature so we have lots of dehydrated cabbage we also have um the uh, like a black currant juice in there so there was some really good studies done where um they found like with raspberries and with blackberries and black currants if they they can actually kill off the bad bacteria and this is this is done, you know, in vitro in the laboratory, and it sort of supports. It might not be as common over there in the U.S., but over here we have um, people talk about giving raspberry cordial when you have what's called barley belly, when you go over to uh, Indonesia, okay, and you get you know a sick tummy from from having the water, and that is actually based in this principle. But you need to make sure that you've actually got the berries in there, so there isn't a um there's been no kind of proven role of sort of you know negative bacteria or bad bacteria in those stomach issues in our horses but when we see these horses that are just having these chronic issues over and over again you know you've got to think okay well maybe there is a bacterial component maybe not in terms of the same way as it is in humans where we have you know a specific bacteria that causes those issues but you know they could be carrying underlying infections, so we have that in there too. We also have the freshly crushed linseed to reduce inflammation. Um, we have pumpkin seeds, which are really high in um, nitric oxide, which helps to just promote um, healing generally, um, as well as boosting that kind of blood flow, boosting metabolism. And um, and we have a pre prebiotic, which is called yeast, which is a yeast based product. So anything that's going to be helping to support that balance of bacteria in the in that hindgut, which is so critical for our horses, that's like the engine room of their digestion. And we have sweet potatoes. So anyone who has a horse, if they have a bit, you know, a bit of an upset tummy, or if you're wanting to give them, a, you know, a lower sugar treat, um, sweet potato is a is a fantastic um, alternative to carrots, and it and it also has that that prebiotic effect. It's a it's a really good. Um, thing to give our horses and so the combination of those ingredients came up with our digestion bars and it still you know blows my mind the transformations that we see with these horses with the digestion bars is just remarkable and it and it's often it often is a physical you know in terms of over the course of that month they will they will change in terms of you don't change anything else in their nutrition, but suddenly their coats, their coats will change color, um, usually become darker, and more glossy, possibly because, you know, their, their gut's just working better. Right. Um, but those really big, significant changes in their attitude. So I had one client where we had a horse. I went to see the horse. She was she was so angry. There was no way in a million years I ever would have even mm. got in the yard with her. She was like a snapping crocodile so and pain. touched it anywhere on yeah. her body and she was just she like she looked like she wanted to hurt you she was very she would never yeah. have hurt the, the the guys that owned her she was you know, she knew better than that but like she was like a like a snapping crocodile and 
they so again and, and a lot of the time you know these horses have tried the, pe the people have tried everything they've tried medications and they've tried other other supplements and they're just the horse just isn't right mm -hmm. and so with this horse she she started she started on the bars and um and after about two weeks the guy gave me a call and he said um he was like i'm gonna have to he had started four horses on the bars and he said i'm gonna have to reevaluate every horse in the stable because wow. he said that their their hierarchy changed the personalities changed and i saw that horse that particular one six months later when i was just passing by and dropped in to say hi and have a coffee i wouldn't have recognized her in a million years wow. she was so peaceful um she I mean she she looked amazing but her whole being was um was at peace and that's where you know that that's probably the biggest thing that i see and and sometimes that can happen as quickly as i think the the quickest one was was two days it was another horse who was very similar mm -hmm. very angry and the guy was very very skeptical <laughs> and he you think the horse changed he, quick then <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> he sent me he sent me a message two days later and he said um i don't believe in magic so i'm gonna give you the credit he was like she is completely different i love that so because, much and it, it's like you know like for me that's where i say to people you know if if it's you know so so many times with our supplements and you know with any supplements and stuff you know it can be so confusing you know we put our faith in you know and you're there and you're going how long do i give it do i, do I give it a month do i give it six mm -hmm. months and you know like how do i know is it actually helping am i just pouring my money down the drain and what i say to people is that you know excuse me we we combine products so again if if the horse is on the digestion bars but the horse is also very anxious you know um, very stressed and very just alert then we combine it with a karma simply because um, when we have those stomach issues like ulcers and stress it's a vicious circle so the the horses that have ulcers are more reactive to stress which means they produce more of the stress hormone mm -hmm. which reduces the ability of that stomach lining to regenerate so you end up in this vicious circle and if you only treat it from this angle you know so if you only go okay my horse is really stressed i need a karma that's not going to work and right. if you're going okay i think my horse has tummy issues so i'm going to treat it with a digestive supplement but they're still really stressed then you're fighting an uphill battle whereas if you come from both angles and then you combine that with starting to you know do the types of things that you work with you know bringing those meditations in bringing in that just that calmness bringing in that gentle exposure okay what is it that they're reacting to you know then you actually start to go okay you know in in one month you you could have the beginnings of a completely different horse and you know a month is not a long time so mm -hmm. you know so i generally will say to people you know if this is going to help you're going to see in a month if it's not going to help you know then two months if you don't see any changes in one month not really going to make a difference to your horse that's great too. It, yeah you know because because i think sometimes it it comes back to everything you know like that really we're looking at what's best for the horses and and with the digestion bars it's it's a combined combination and that's where you know we combine it with the protection mm -hmm. so we have our pre-work bars or our digestive support elixir which is like can be syringed or can be mixed within that small feed because if you're putting all that work into to helping to rebuild their digestive tract then you need to support them when they're doing the one thing you know or the two things work and travel which can cause those problems to reoccur and some horses like like us you know are more vulnerable and you know i do believe that there is you know a hereditary aspect and a genetic disposition um you know plus we also have nutritional factors and everything else so you know so it's 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 really looking at it and saying okay what i find with the digestion bars is that it gives the it gives the person the opportunity to find where they find who their horse is 
Mm -hmm. And if they can find who their horse is in that in that peace point, then it gives them a place to say, okay, now I know where you are. Now I need to know how to keep you there. And and I think that once you've had that experience with your horse of actually seeing who they are, it's it's well, A, it's very hard to ignore when yeah. they're not who they are. But I think as well, you know, for a lot of people, they never even get to experience that. So how can someone know what it is that they're striving for if they've never actually experienced it in the first place? Totally. So yeah, it's definitely worth it to check out Penny. Um, I'll put her link again underneath this video, you guys. Um, thank you so much for taking this time. I'm going to ask you one more question and we want to keep it super short. So okay I will what would that. be what would be on your billboard for people to see in the horse world so it has to be super short what would it be <laughs> uh prevention is better than the cure i love it always prevention that's awesome i will make it for you <laughs> i'm making the billboards for everyone so you can share that um, fantastic I want to thank you again. This was a gorgeous interview. I loved hearing all this information. Thank you for sharing it and yeah. being so generous with your time and your resources. And yeah, if you guys want to get a hold of Penny, I'm sure she'd be happy to do consults. Um, and yeah, you can just find out what what her services are and reach out anytime. Thank you again. Uh, this was wonderful. Cool. Yes. And uh, remember, everyone, to lead with kindness for yourself and for your horse. And may the horse be with you always.